on most podcasts. It's actually not bad. <laughs> it's really good, bro. Well what a time to be alive, folks. It is uh, a beautiful day in Melbourne. We're still in lockdown. We'll probably always be in it, but I do want to thank all the subscribers and listeners out there. As I mentioned, we did take a few weeks off. We're back on deck. This is the third week in a row, and this is a special week. This is a special episode because it's the first kind on the Unlaced podcast. Everyone knows us for bringing on these great athletes, and it might be contentious because he could be a great athlete, but he's definitely an unbelievable DJ. DJ Generic, or as his friends and family like to call him, Tyson, mate, welcome to the show. G'day, Jakey. It's <laughs> lovely to be here. Um, I feel pretty honoured that... Um my athleticism is uh, <laughs> finally being noticed. It's, it's unbelievable. You know what? It's your, you know what's got you on this show? It's like we're going to go into your DJ DJ dreams and what you've done because we all want to be you. But yeah. your genuine passion on Instagram around sporting posts just made me think there's an intense love you have for, for sport, for AFL in particular. Yeah, I think I'm the only Collingwood supporter in the history of time to have all my teeth. <laughs> and, um, yeah, so I feel pretty honoured. I'm pretty passionate. It... Oh, g'day, Campbell. How's it going, mate? <laughs> Not like we're saying? recording, but, yeah, yeah no, how's it going? Mate, Campbell was just on last week. And probably the best story, which everyone that's not in the studio, Campbell Brown's just knocked on the, uh, the window there, scared the life out of Tyson, but... Um, Campbell was on the previous episode. If you haven't listened to that one, guys, get back and listen to that because Campbell can tell a story underwater. It was unbelievable. Um, also, last time I probably saw Campbell in person was in Las Vegas. <laughs> and uh, I'll actually send you the video that I sent to him last week to pump oh, him up for his mate. show um, of him just his shirt undone in the booth thinking he's God's gift <laughs> to humans. And uh, I gave his big belly a big old slap with a, with a, with a fist there. And um, <laughs> I'll send that through to oh, you. Oh, God, we might have to clip it. that. Jeez, if it's, if it's PG. But, uh, mate, he's a, he's a great bloke. Great yeah, bloke. a lot of fun. Yeah. Barrel of laughs. I told, him, I told him last week I was actually a bit nervous getting him on the show because I've, he's in the studio all the time. Yeah. I'm like, if you saw him play footy, I'm like, he just used to clobber people. I'm like, if I don't get this pitch right, like... I might get a stern look or a bloody stiff arm to the chest here, and I'm like, but no, mate, he's a, he's a good bloke. Yeah, you want to make sure you answer uh, or ask all the right questions <laughs> yeah, and nothing don't that, sit, that don't set him, him off. off. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. But um, no, look, you just mentioned it there. Now, for those, and we're going to go into the DJ exploits of, of Generic, aka Tyson, as we mentioned, but absolute diehard Collingwood fan. Yeah, it's it's an issue. Um, well. I can't watch football very often. I get, <laughs> I get so angry, so passionate. Um, I like see red. Um, Do you yeah, really? The black and white bleeds through my veins. But it's not, it's not even like a fake love. Like it's not even like when – because I look at your Instagram and this is when I was talking about you comment on everything. And I'm talking like when there's people in the Magoos that someone of maybe your status wouldn't really be interested in how they're going. You have an opinion. I oh, know. I'm, <laughs> I'm all over it. I want to know who our next stars are, where they're coming from. I, all these first years, I'm, I'm getting around them. Yeah. And it's usually because I'm meeting them at nightclubs as well. <laughs> I'm a bit older, so, like, I see all these young kids in nightclubs and, like, when I see a Collingwood player in a nightclub, I usually tell them to go home because um, I'm like, no, we've got a grand final win. So yeah, it's like, yeah. get the hell home. Yeah, they don't like you on the They're night. Like, nah, it's like if, if I'm starting work at 2 a.m., I don't want to see any any Collingwood players out there. Otherwise, I'm, I'm sending them home. I'm like, go home to your mum, go home to your girlfriend or whoever and get out of here. We've got, we've got some games to win. See, Collingwood fans will love that. Role model season. He's not taking them astray. He's sending them home. Yeah, exactly. That's what we want. But why, why, why the pies? Uh, dad. Um, yeah, it was I, – I was just brought up Collingwood and um, I actually did defect for a year because Collingwood were going through quite a rough patch. We were <laughs> – When was this? Oh, this is like Tony Shaw had like oh, – okay. it's, it's just like – 90s. Yeah, 90s. We were really bad. Right. And uh, my older cousin, who's about four years older than me, he went for, the, for Footscray at the time okay. and they were killing it. And I'm like, Jump this shit. is crap. <laughs> I don't want to watch Collingwood lose all the time. I want to watch a winning team. <laughs> So dad made a deal with me. He goes, I'll take you to some games for the dogs. You can follow them for the whole year. We even end up going to a, a final against Geelong. Um, had a scarf, flag, jumper, went to the Witten Oval. I had a great year. Do <laughs> dogs, dogs were up and about. I'm like, at the end of the year, dad went, okay, um, do you want to go for Collingwood or the Bulldogs? 
I go, I want to go for the Bulldogs. Daddy goes, okay, you got to go live with your auntie. <laughs> and I didn't want to live with my auntie, so I went straight back to Collingwood. That's unbelievable. Yeah, so it's it's been ingrained in me from a very, very young age. Why do you think, like, why do people hate Collingwood so much? Like, what, what's the, what is it? Because oh, it's only because we're the greatest club in Australia. Yeah, that's fucking, that, that club answer is exactly why. Exactly right. <laughs> it's, it's, no, nah, I just, I, it, it's, you either love them or hate them. It's black and white. That's, yeah. and that's what we are. It's, we're incredibly passionate supporters Quite often we're pretty useless as well, and we're still adamant that we're we're great. I still thought with four games to go we're going to make the finals, <laughs> and even though because we're mathematically a Possible, chance, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, little did I know we're going to get belted by Brisbane by four hundred points. True. But um, yeah, it's just I think it's there is some arrogance to it, but it's just a, a deep sense of pride. Yeah, in I admire the, it. You the know, like, I actually have. genuinely do admire it because I've been to a few Collingwood games, and I reckon it's one of the greatest sporting spectacles to take a tourist to who doesn't know Melbourne or Australia because they just get the rudest culture shock ever. Yeah, it's pr- it's pretty pretty intense. <laughs> there, there's, mate, there's no re- bad. Yeah, there's a reason there's usually a new story coming out of a Collingwood game. <laughs> uh, the, yeah, the fans are pretty special. We're all we're all very much alike. Yeah, yeah. Well, eight year olds have a have a pretty stern word and speak French very well from from Bay Thirteen at the MCG. Yeah, but definitely. We've had a we've had a few like athletes obviously in the last year on the show in particular the ones that have been playing sports where COVID's just destroyed the game or destroyed whatever they were training for whether it be the olympics or even the afl's had its hubs and the soccer's just been moving around from a fan perspective like we've never really had an opinion of what it's been like for for the Mm. people watching it and and obviously the, the, the passionate supporters like yourself has it really changed much for you? Has it pissed you off? Has it, you know, how, how's it worked for you to go through it? Well, for a start, it was the only thing that kept me sane last year yeah. was having football because for me personally, my life completely changed. Um, I'm blessed in itself that I'm still happy and healthy and all that stuff, but I went from travelling the world regularly um, for the last 10 years to not leaving my apartment for a year and... I know that it might sound like, oh, cry me a river story, but it's a massive, um, massive mental hurdle to get over. Mm. And it really sort of, yeah, really, really hit me hard last year. And I didn't realise. And yeah. without the footy, I would have gone completely insane because it was yeah. something to look forward to. It was a lot different watching on TV with the no crowd and stuff. And that aspect was a little harder to get into. But for me personally, because it was on it was on and, and I could watch it and that footy mm. frenzy where it was a game a day, mm. that was awesome for me and I loved it and I quickly forgot about that there was no crowds there and, and whatever and I was just so happy to have sort of footy and have something to look forward to every day because oh, yeah. as a lot of people, there wasn't much to look forward to and we're still here at the moment. So, yeah, yeah it's hard to sort of look past that aspect. Um it must have been pretty bloody hard for the players. I know. Um, I know. Just like that. I mean, if we talk on AFL, I think, I mean, part of me thinks it was it was hard because obviously they've been away for so long. But then I'm thinking, like, some of them were locked up in Noosa and Sunshine Coast. Yeah. In a nice little resort for three months. Would have been handy. But yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> it's nice, but it's also, like, if it's not where you want to be, yeah, it's, 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 tough, it's very man. easy to sort of... It's tough. Yeah, yeah. Not, not feel that way. But... I. Look, I wouldn't mind being trapped in Noosa right now. <laughs> like if I was if I was quarantined in Queensland and I couldn't leave. Oh wow, yeah, bad, bad luck, me. Um, but did you did that make you realise how much you loved footy? Like, yeah, absolutely. That period when yeah. it's kind of taken away a little bit, or it wasn't the same as well, what it was. It's like I'm I moved to America. What was it like six years ago? And so I was in I was living in LA for four years, and I missed footy huge huge wow. amounts. Like I I bought the Watch AFL pass. And the time zone was absolutely the worst. Like yeah. Collingwood games were starting at 2.50 a.m. So to stay up to watch them, it's really tricky. So, yeah. like, <laughs> I'd start having a few beers at, like, 8, 9 o'clock. <laughs> By the time the game comes around at 2.50 a.m., you're plastered. You end up missing half of the thing. And then you fall asleep. You wake up the next day at midday and you got to watch the replay. <laughs> so, technically, I should have just... Gone to sleep, sleep, woken up, and watched the replay. You've hurt yourself for no yeah, reason. Yeah, so I I really missed it, and I I stayed. I actually won my my mate's footy tipping three out of the four years I was away because oh, no I would be listening to Sen in the mornings while I'm getting ready and or or doing Ubers and stuff. And yeah, yeah. So I was I I always sort of maintained my sort of love for AFL, but then 
Yeah, last year. Like, I came back in end of 2019 and I'd only been to one ga- or two games in four years. Uh, one was the Anzac Day game where we just held on against the Dons yeah. um, and was there with Swanee. So that was a, oh, that was a fantastic that's a night. Cool. That's a story in itself. Yeah, there was a few drinks afterwards <laughs> with, with Taz and Dimmer and Licker. So oh, was, the Rat a, Pack, we love that. Yeah, I was, I was in heaven taking speckies at Siglo. That was awesome. <laughs> um, and then the other one was the 2018 Grand Final. And Were you here for that? Uh, well, kind of. So I was going to say, you would have been in the States. I was in the then. States and we were watching the Richmond prelim and me and my mate, we had, we had about five people over watching the game. And my girlfriend at the time, she got a bit drunk, so she went to bed. So she was asleep at like 11 o'clock at night before the game even started. Yeah. And we were so blind that with about two minutes to go and we were like 40 points up against Richmond, we still thought we could lose. We're like, this is Collingwood. We can lose this. <laughs> we didn't have the concept of time. Um, and then so as soon as the game finished, uh, when Campbell Brown was in Vegas, he was there with Sam Fisher. And Sam Fisher promised me... Um, his ticket to the grand final because he'd won one for his charity work that he'd done. Wow. And so I messaged Sam, like, have I, have I got the ticket? He's like, yeah, no problems, ticket's yours. So I booked return flights to the grand final then and there. Oh, my and God. And then had to tell my girlfriend when we woke her up at 5 a.m. to take <laughs> her home that I was going back to Melbourne to watch the grand final. And, oh, no. uh, yeah, then... It's a long story of, of, of just bad misfortune and what happened that day <laughs> and night before and everything. Um, and I won't throw Sam Fisher under the bus for getting too <laughs> wasted and not having my ticket, but then we finally got the ticket. Oh, my God, that's unbelievable. Yeah, that'll be a, a, that's, that's a different... That's another podcast, Yeah, that's maybe. another podcast <laughs> in itself. But, um, yeah, I was literally back for 36 hours and we lost and I went back and then my girlfriend, like, I land back in LA at like 6 a.m. She goes, oh, what a waste of six and a half grand. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, yeah. That, and that's the reason we're no longer together. Yeah, so, it um, wasn't supportive. <laughs> not at all. Jesus, that's, mate, that's unbelievable. I didn't actually realise you came back for that. Yeah, so I, can't, I got back the morning of the, the grand final parade, had a nice long lunch, and then, oh. yeah, went the next day. And what a heartbreaking and then, grand final too. Yeah, like then, wasn't wasn't like just a loss. It was like it was. I was right behind the kick too. From oh, Sheed. Don Sheed, you and then, special and then, yeah, human. like went walked to the train station, missed the train, so then got stuck with all the supporters. This kid that went to school the year below with me jumped on the train and wanted to talk to me for the entire way back home. And then, like, my fish and chips got burnt from the fish and chip shop. <laughs> and then I realised I wasn't watching anything on TV. I was just staring at a blank screen oh, and no. went and to bed at, like, 8 o'clock and then woke up at 6 a.m., text a few mates to hang out. But because everyone was hungover, no, no one woke up, up. And I left and went back to America. So it was my a disaster. Goodness gracious me. The journey of the AFL fan. That's a... Electric story, given yeah. the nature of the flight. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, and the funds behind it to then lose off the arguably the greatest kick of all time. Oh, it's like ice in the veins. Yeah, like, just was, shocking. You've got to give it to him. Like, it's, it's unbelievable. Yeah, he's he, every time now he's in that position. Like it's just like everyone just knows he's going to kick it. He through. owes every single Collingwood supporter a beer. Yeah, I think so like, too. Absolutely. I think that'll that'll square it up. Yeah. But, if we go into the season that was, obviously you touched on Pies just missing out in the finals. Obviously, there's a few notable things that happened this year with Buckley leaving, Pendles having a huge injury, a couple of people finding some form, a lot of young players getting blooded in. I mean, what did you make of the year for, for the Collingwood Football Club? Well, I was lucky enough to go to the Melbourne uh, Collingwood game in Sydney. I happened to have a gig that the night before, so I extended my trip. and That was Buck's last yeah, game? Yeah, and so I got to see the game, and it was amazing. Yeah. And for me, that's how Collingwood... That's how I know that they play. They're just the ferocity of the ball. They were just so tenacious that day. And they they dominated the Ds. And as you can tell, the Ds are red-hot favourites for the flag this year. Yeah. They should yeah, win it. Like, really, it's everything on paper. Exactly right. So we just bought it that day. And that's what I love to see. And that's, um, I think, Darcy Moore's early season form really sort of doesn't get he's sort of brought up in the line. He's a freak, isn't he? Like, he was all Australian, 100%. He's gone down with the injury yeah. again and sorry that's one thing that happened too he, yeah losing him well, massive. Yeah, Jeremy well, Howe when you well. lose Jeremy Howe and Darcy Moore it's um Jeez. yeah some big big holes but Geordie's season this year was absolutely massive um just the way he sort of he was just a complete ball in the midfield this year it was awesome to see really really good to see and then got guys like Jack and Bo McCreary the little small yeah. forwards it's just 
just that little bit of sort of vibe for next year sort of gives that. Have you got hope from this year going into next year? Definitely. We've got two Dacoses, yeah, mate. The I grand know. finals are. Do you know what? I've already seen you on the Insta to Nick Dacos, the number one draft pick. I've already yeah. seen that relationship brewing. Yeah, I, I'm. I, uh, <laughs> yeah, I won't. I won't throw him under any buses yeah, there, good. mate. Yeah. He's a good young fellow. Both the boys are. Mate, he is seriously like the the rumor mill coming out of him is like no other. Yeah, it's like as a Collingwood supporter, when you pick up the age of the Herald Sun and you're seeing like this Oakley Charger kid on the back page. 40 touches, you, three you, goals every week. Your pants get a little stiff. <laughs> it's, it's pretty exciting, I've got to admit. Oh. I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say that. It's a podcast, who knows? No, mate, yeah, it's, it's all clean lit on this. It's, uh, yeah, it, it's exciting times. And I, look, I, the way I see the pies now with, with McRae and, and obviously Leffich is coming in as well, I see it especially that, that article that I was reading from McRae, how he wants to get the tackling back on. That is what Collingwood's 2009 to 12 campaign was, just that ferocity. And that's what mm. Richmond have had for the, the last few years. Yeah. It's just that manic pressure. Yeah. And I want to see all our little small guys just absolutely tackling the bejesus out of teams and, yeah. and just, yeah, putting, you, putting the pressure if, on. You're happy if you go down and you see that though, aren't you, as a supporter? I, I, I think, and that's what the, the good thing about Collingwood's season was this year. They, they gave it. They're all, all year. There was no, the, well, the, the couple of games they laid down, like the Brisbane one and stuff, <laughs> yeah. which we won't go into. He's put that but, in there, Sneak. But look, it's the second last game of the year, as if they could be bothered. Like, I wouldn't have even gone. Um, so, yeah, it's, I'm, I am looking forward to next year already. I wish they just give Melbourne the cup already. We can go on with it and just yeah. start the season again. My uh, goodness. Uh, you touched on Geordie DeGoey, our mutual friend. Um, shout out to Jordan. Soon to be on the Unlaced podcast, we hope. It's, I, it'll I, be... I heard he's a big fan. He subscribes and likes yes, all the time. so he should. He's probably listening now. Good boy, Jordan. But, mate, what does he mean to the Collingwood Football Club? Because, like, he's a superstar and they throw his name in the rumour mill, they throw his name on the papers. But I actually messaged him at the end of the season and said, bro, you are a strong fella. Like, mm. you're a strong mental bloke because you've been through hell and back and he's had – probably the best season of his career, like from a performance standpoint, in a relatively new position, they're blooding him in. Definitely. Definitely. Yeah. Um, he's He's been amazing this year, like really amazing. And I think I can speak on behalf of Collingwood supporters where we don't listen to a lot of the stuff that gets written because a lot of it's just BS. And Junk. the yeah. way that they, they anyone just want, Collingwood sells papers. We yeah. all know this. They yeah. sell articles. Like 100%. People will click when you see a Collingwood player doing something dumb or we, or if they've had one bad game. Like yesterday, Kingy potting uh, Trelaw saying that he's like done. It's like, mate, he's had one bad game. He's coming off massive injuries all year and you want to pot him. And That's it's like, so, so, and, they, and they're saying like, oh, Collingwood has won that trade battle off. I'm like, Jesus. Yeah, the mate. Bulldogs are where they're in the prelim. I, I know, yeah. I think, I think we've lost the trade. Trust me, <laughs> oh we finished God. 17th. Yeah. And, and we've given away our pick as well. So, yeah, we, I think we lost that trade, Kingy. But, no, jordy has been amazing this year. And I think just for Collingwood supporters, you just want to see that consistency. And he was so consistent this year. He was, year. wasn't he? 30 uh, every week, 25 every exactly. week. Exactly. And then I reckon next year with, with that extra sort of having this year under his belt and the experience and what he's learning – you get another preseason into him, even more of a tank, and then hitting the scoreboard as well as those thirty. Geez, he'll be bloody right up there in a brown low. If, bloody oath. If, yeah. if this was sponsored by a sports betting company, I <laughs> dare say jump on now. Jump on, no, no, right. Put a, put a couple of shekels uh, <laughs> and uh, then watch the number two for Collingwood next year. Just absolutely light it up. Amen. Shout out to Jordy Degoe. We love you, mate. Um, Let's go through, like, what's a good good year next year for, for you, for the for the Collingwood Football Club? What do you reckon would you be happy with? Finals? Do you see you going further? Do you need a full forward? Do you need someone? Like, yeah, we do. We've needed one for about four or five is that, years is now. Is that all that's missing? Like, because I feel like if you guys had picked up Cameron, hypothetically, yeah. it's a hot different ball game, isn't I, it? I, I, I'd like to think so. Yeah. Um, I've got a theory. And, <laughs> and, and, that's theory time. It's, uh, yeah. <laughs> this is what the sports board, this podcasts are all about, right? So... <laughs> You got the the Gold Coast, right? They put out their um like their best and fairest. And Ben King doesn't even make the top ten, right? No. And he kicked sixty odd goals wherever he kicked. And he's he had, not he's loved. Had, he's had, he's not loved down there. He's not loved. You know what's loved? <laughs> he has another season up there doing real well. 
And then we just swipe him oh, to the pies a year that after. That is a good shout, so you know. I reckon we can go with a little mosquito fleet next year. <laughs> and then we uh, just put a king boy down there. Yeah, they're you wondering look- why DJ Generics just moved up to the Gold Coast for 12 months. Yeah, exactly. There you go. Uh, Secret scouting mission. Yeah, ex- yeah, look out. I'm coming <laughs> for you. All right, let's go into the grand final. Oh, the, I should say we're in the prelim, but by yep. the time this comes out, we might actually know who's going to be playing. So... I'm going to put you on the spot here because there's four teams. There might be two out now when this episode's out. So let's see All right. how the DJ generic goes. Who, what's your tip for the grand final and then winner? Well, I think Melbourne get the chocolates this week against Geelong. Yep. I think that that game down at Kadinia Park or whatever it's called, um, <laughs> that was a little skewed because Geelong just had that five minutes where they went bang, bang, bang. Mm. Um, but it was a very, very even game up until there. And then Melbourne clawed it back. So I think Melbourne are... A lot stronger than what they sort of gave off. Yeah, yeah. Although Scott resting Dangerfield on the bench for 16 minutes in the last quarter, they kind of interesting move. They kind of put put the cue in the rack a bit, <laughs> so you ne- you don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, but Geelong's a tough one. Yeah, I think I think Melbourne get it done there, and I just think that with Bontempelli having that knee injury, um, Trelaw sort of not flying at the moment. And then Waitman going down as well, as well as Joshy Bruce out. I think Port Adelaide just get it done, especially at home. Yeah. It's uh, pretty easy sleeping in your own bed, walking to the ground and just playing a game of footy as opposed to the travel that the dogs have had. Although I would love to see the dogs upset the power because yeah. then the battle for the prison bars is no longer, well, is it? I tell you, <laughs> there's a bit of hatred there. The power, I tell you what, they've been in a, a sh- they've been in a window for a few years. They want to make the most of this, I reckon. Yeah, And they, they have strengthened, but... The, the grand final is going to be in Perth. Yeah. So we're going off your record here. Melbourne versus Port Adelaide. Yeah. And I th- I think the D's. S- similar ground to the G. Yeah. Similar that, sort of vibe. And that's that's the understanding I'm going with. I've, it's a similar dimensions to the G. It's a, it's going to be a normal grand final where there's going to be 80% corporates and 10% supporters for each team. Yeah, yeah. So that's yeah. not going to make a difference. But I just think Melbourne get it done. I just think their defence is so rock solid. The Lever May combo has been absolutely amazing this yeah, year. And they just stifle team scoring. And if Charlie Dixon, if he can't kick five or six, they're not winning. Right. It's going to be interesting. I tell you what, we're going to come back. Well, I might even clip this at some point if... If uh, this tip comes true, this this little clip's going to go viral. Melbourne by 18 and a half. <laughs> oh, how dare you? Cover the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, awesome. Awesome. Well, we're going to transition into what everyone wants to know, and particularly me because... I was going to say, that's actually a good segue. Transition, transition. like between songs, <laughs> DJing. Yeah, <laughs> I like is. that one. Yeah, yeah. We're, just changing, we're just changing decks here, mate. Yeah, Have all right. Smooth transition. But, no, my dad's got a... My dad always has this question. What's your dream job? And he goes, you always can tell a person and how they're going to be with their response. And so I go, a oh, fireman, you know, doctor, yeah, fair yeah. enough. I asked my dad what his is, international DJ. <laughs> Straight <laughs> off the get-go. He's 50, he's, he's early 50s. He's got the right idea. Mate, he's, he's like, dude, what a fucking job. That's, yeah. that's his language. Like, what a job. And, mate, you are a DJ. Oh, I was. Was. Well, well yeah, I'm going to give bit, you credit. Yeah, of, it's, a bit, it's a bit hard at the moment. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. <laughs> I would be if I could leave my house. And I'm going to put international in front of you because we're going to go into why. Yeah, all right. But before we go into, like, you know, some of the some of the cool stories of what you do, like what really got you interested in music and, like, creating and then becoming an actual DJ? Um, I was kind of like, at school, I loved sport and I was decent at it. But I was never going to make the, the the A team in footy. Cricket, different story. But footy, no, I was never going to make the A team. Right. So I knew there was no hope to be an athlete. <laughs> yeah. So why try? So I'm not going to put all this effort and time into trying to become better and getting fit, fitter and stronger <laughs> if I know I'm not going to make it. Yeah, yeah. So I put all my time and effort into music and art. And right. um, that's where my sort of love was. And so I would always be listening to music. Um, all my mates did played in played lots of instruments and we just go and jam at mates' houses on Saturdays and Friday nights and stuff like that. And then through growing up, um, like when I finished high school, my mates were kind of like into that indie indie rock and all that scene. And I wanted to go meet girls, um, so I would go out with all the girls that I knew to yes. the nightclub, and I'd be the only guy going with them. Wow. So that was genius for one. That is gen- Well, that's a hard thing to do in itself. Yeah. So well, kudos. Also, because guys at the time with nightclubs couldn't get into nightclubs. True. So you needed chicks. You needed, you needed girls to go with you. So yeah. I'd just go with them and I'd go to Prince and at One Love and down in St Kilda. Beautiful. And, and, and get in. That was my way to get in. And then I was at Big Day Out 
and I saw too many DJs play and they were playing Iggy Pop and The Strokes and then Acid House and Fatboy Slim all mixed in together. And I'm like, oh, so you can like rock and roll, but you can like that doof doof stuff as well. And it kind of goes well together. I'm like, I can do this. No way. And then so we we were consistently going to this club, uh, 161. Yeah. In Paran on a Thursday night though. So Famous it was, club. It was indie night. Indie. And like, so they used to have bands, like the presets and cut copy, Midnight Juggernauts, they all played their first shows on a Thursday night at, at 161. You're joking. Yeah. Uh, it was like for street parties, Shake Some Action was That's the night. awesome. And um, when you're the guy that was booking the night and he goes, oh, do you want to come and guest DJ one night? So I got out all my CDs and just was playing like Interpol into like New Order into like Block Party remixes and it kind of went off. Wow. And then he goes, you want to come back and do this every week? And I did. And then I kind of get a, started to get a bit of a following in like the indie scene. And then I was becoming mates with all the guys like from Cut Copy and Midnight Juggernauts and all the modular acts that were starting to kill it. major global yeah. superstars. Yeah. And this is all like, this is really early, like 2005 and six. So how old are you here? You finishing high school? I finished, out of high, high school? Yeah, I finished high school 2004. So I'm so like 18. Of- yeah, I'm like 18 and, and started this this caper and then um yeah then got approached by one love to come and dj in their back room and i didn't even know how to like beat match and and i said yeah like straight away because i'm like this is too good of an opportunity and then i got roasted after the first week on the one love forums which were a massive thing before facebook and myspace kids wow. like for those listening it was a forum and um i got absolutely hammered like because i had no skills whatsoever great track selection as everyone said but no skill. So um, I got put together with a guy, China, and um, who now owns a bunch of restaurants in Queensland all of a sudden. <laughs> strange uh, move. Yeah, Good on definitely, you. definitely a strange move. <laughs> and then um, he kind of taught me how to DJ as we went. And then, um, yeah, then it, it moved pretty quickly. So then from, from DJing in the back room there, I was playing around at Seven Nightclub around the corner from here and a whole bunch of other places. And then I started working with the One Love guys more on their record label. And then also Stereosonic popped up. Jeez. And... Uh, it was kind of my role to talent scout acts and tell them what was cool and who to tour. And we From had a DJ point of yeah, view. Like, so, yeah. So to try and find an act before it blows up in the mainstream so you can get them at a really cheap price. <laughs> and then by the time the festival comes around, you can make a lot of money off them. Yeah. So um, me and another mate who worked at the office there, we found like bloody beetroots and crookers and we were actually responsible for LMFAO. We booked them so far in advance before they had all their hits, and then by the time the festival came around, we felt guilty that we didn't pay them enough money, so we gave them extra cash. Like, wow. So, so you found LMFAO? Yeah. Like, so How? Uh, well, Afrojack had this song, Take Over Control, like yes. out at the time, massive tune. Great song. And I heard a mate of mine goes, oh, look at these like clowns from America, and <clears throat> I heard that it was like the video on YouTube had had 137 views, and I'm like, this is, a, this is massive. We've got to book them. So I sent it to the directors. They're like, yeah, this is great. And then by the time they booked them, the video had had like a million spins and it would just started going. Oh, that's and then awesome. they had like five top ten hits in Australia by the time Stereosonic came out. So oh, wow. There's, like, there's a lot of things that like sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Like we booked Duke Jumont, but really early on in his career and he had like 35 people at a stage. That's like, one not, of my favourite DJs. Duke. But then six months later, he came back to Australia and played a 5,000-person like venue. <laughs> so sometimes it worked, sometimes it didn't. Um, but, yeah, and then so from there, I met Calvin Harrison. Yeah. Wow, we're going to go into I'm, that. I, I figured we're, you were. I, didn't wanna, I wanted to, to shut up a little bit. the only reason I brought you in here. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's I know. the coolest story of all time. Yeah, it's not bad. Like, I will sit at home and listen to this on repeat when you tell me about it. But yeah. before I get it, because I do want to build into it and – like, we, we joked before on the phone when you said you were here and we're like, mate, people don't respect how hard it is being a DJ. Forget being a pro athlete. Like, you go around the clock with no sleep, multiple days at a time, going from gig to gig to gig. And I always think, like, there's a side to a pro athlete that a lot of people don't know until they're it that is quite ugly. Like, yeah. it's, it's hard. You get injuries. You're alone. It's not always as fun as it seems. There's a lot of pressure. Like, you miss a kick. You're hated by 80,000 people. But everyone wants to be it. You know what I mean? Yeah. Is there an element of that with being like a, you know, quite a superior, well-known DJ? Like 100%. With, really? 100%. And you'll, you hit the nail on the head with the lonely factor as well. It's, it does get very lonely on the road because it's usually just you or maybe like a tour manager. So there's like two of you. And it's those days where you may have had like three or four shows in a row 
and you're at the hotel. It's 7 p.m. at night. You've just had, had a feed and you're not going on until 2 a.m. And the only thing you want to do is just go to sleep and just miss the gig, but you can't. Um, mm. And you just got to get up and perform. And the hardest part is getting to the line, but then once you cross that line, it's easy. Because yeah. as soon as you hit play on that first song, yeah, the energy up. from the crowd Picks and you and it just you, you, you're good, but it's just getting to the line. Yeah. And, um, yeah, the hard, the hard thing is the travelling aspect and keeping that balance of sobriety, which is a massive thing. I've put my hand up now and say that's where I'd fall down. It's where I fall down a lot. I might not turn up to day three and four, but day one and two will yeah, be you're memorable. You're good. You're good. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like that's a that's a got to be yeah self discipline. Yeah. You have right? got to pick your moments. Um, at the start, you don't, <laughs> and it's the best. <laughs> but see, do you have people on your team? Like you mentioned, you got tour managers and stuff. Are the people there like pulling you, like pulling you back, saying, "Mate, we've got to be, you know, at this place at this time." Funny or, enough, or are they I, the are they the people that are pushing you? Funny enough, I was the one pulling my tour manager into line. <laughs> um, no, I think I because I've just been doing it for so long. I just know what to do. I know what's expected. You know when you can have fun, when you can't. Yeah. Um, and I still blur those lines. I still have a lot of fun. Like, yeah. don't get me wrong. But um, every now and then there's times where you're just like, okay, tonight's a sober night. We, we need this. We need we're, we're, we're all good. We're all good. So I'm going to jump into what everyone wants to know. But just quickly on that point, yeah. are all DJs like like that? Do are they all blurred lines or there's some that are completely straight and nah, narrow and nah, just all music? Heaps straight. Heaps, heaps yeah. of straight, yeah. And, and, and that the, might be the case. The, the thing is, right, when you get to a certain level – that's when the party lifestyle, you cannot do it. You can't. Like, no. when you've got guys like Martin Garrix who are playing, like, two shows a day in two countries, jetting from here to there, and then they've got um, record label people pulling them here and there for interviews and this and that, and then you've got to write music as well while you're touring through summer, and there's, there's no way you can do it. No. Um, th it's, it's funny that the techno and deeper house guys, they still party a lot but that's kind of their vibe <laughs> yeah because okay. they don't have that sort of commercial <laughs> sense of having to do interviews and have that sort of perfect image mm. um but yeah it's when you when you get to a certain level you just cannot do it you got you, you really pick and choose your moments wow that's and fascinating to me yeah so like when you when you're sort of like up and coming and you're a little sort of a lower tier guy you get to have the best fun because it's not really that serious. Nothing really matters too much. And you can just go and enjoy yourself and enjoy yeah. what you're doing. But when you get to that mega scale and when you're talking about like when pyrotechnics and everything's all timed and when you've got to, when it's a show, an actual show, when you're the boss up there, you can't be off your head. No, of no. course not. That Although be... Fisher does a pretty good job no, of it. <laughs> but is that an act or is that No, like, man, that's, that's who that, he is. Like, is he genuinely off his head? Like, he's not off his head all the time. He just has a really good time. He and looks like he's having the best time of his life. Why man. wouldn't he? He's yeah. travelling the world, playing his songs, just, just flipping that wrist. flicking his wrist, having a ball. Mate, and he's, what a guy. He's so good at what he does too. What a guy. Doesn't he carry the Australian brand so well? Good yeah, man. yeah. I reckon there's a lot of people tuning in that might not be necessarily knowing a lot of DJs. There's probably some that are, but I reckon everyone would know who Calvin Harris is. Yeah, well, my mum does. The, that yeah. says it all. Calvin Harris is arguably the, one of the biggest names in the music industry, period, let alone any sort of segment or genre. Like, he is so big. And a birdie told me that you and him have a great relationship, so much so you opened for him for quite some time. So... That I just sit there. I almost had to sit down after someone told me that because when you meet you, you are one of the most down to earth blokes ever, oh, thank and you've you. and you've worked with one of the greatest musicians of all time in in sort of our generation. So, like, how on earth has that relationship like collided and and happened? Well, I met him at Stereosonic um, backstage and just got along with his tour manager at the time really well, um, and him, and we just had had a lot of fun. So. Um, Really, it was just like two blokes hanging out, and that's that's all that's all it ever was. And um, it was kind of before he was who he is now. Like he's the biggest act on the planet. So what year was this? Oh God, like twenty twenty eleven, maybe. Okay. And then he um called me, I think it was in twenty thirteen, and was like, "Hey, I'm in Europe for like all of summer. Um, 
I'm going to be bored of my crew. Why don't you come over and hang out? I'm like, okay, cool. So like I went over and jumped on his pri- on the private jet for the month and w- we went away. I went, went over for two weeks and like we just, I think we landed in the UK, went straight to Croatia that night and um, <laughs> yeah, I remember vomiting in my sink from drinking way too much Don Julio tequila, 1942. <laughs> Jesus, the and, um, and that was like that was like night one, and I was like, oh wow, okay, this, 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 be this, a big this, this is good. And Do you then, know, I've had a, I've had dreams of like big artists just going like, dude, I, I like you, kid. Like, just come yeah. hang out. That's actually happened to you. Well, I'll, I'll do that. Like, I'll say, like, hey, Jakey, let's get an Uber together and, like, go to the pub. Yeah, <laughs> that, 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 that will do. That's my level. <laughs> yeah, no, that'll but, do. Um, yeah, and then from there, uh, he asked me to come and support him in, in Vegas and warm up for him. And then I was doing a whole bunch of other warm-ups for him in through Europe and in Ibiza. So we are in Ibiza in 2018 and 17 for three months. So that was amazing. And we were due to go back in 2019. Or, no, yeah, 2020. Yeah, yeah 2020. And then... Everything else happened, but um, yeah, he he's he's such a talented dude. Um, he's so driven, and now he's obsessed with his gardening, and he's in a full on farmer lifestyle. And what a guy. and yeah, and I can't speak speak highly enough of the guy. He's, he's given me a lot of opportunities that I probably would never have had. Um, very very thankful, and yeah, it's he's killing me in in our uh, EPL fantasy league at the moment. Oh no way, is I'm, he? I'm getting destroyed. Where is he actually from? Uh, he's from Scotland, from Scotland. Dumfries. Okay. Um and yeah, then been living in LA, so does he have cuz does he have residency in Vegas anywhere? Ah, uh, he did. He did. He did. Okay, so he yeah. doesn't anymore. No, so not not at this stage. Well, obviously, yeah. yeah. So and then in from a Europe standpoint, like when you say you were in Ibiza for a few months, was he were you guys having a residency at a certain yeah, place for a w- period? Yeah, he he had a pasha um, oh, wow. At night time, yep. and then Ushuaia oh, for the day the and evening. The greatest place on earth. Yeah, so um, we were ha- we had quite a bit of fun. Oh, well, I God. definitely did, because um, I'd I'd start the night off, so like at Ushuaia, <laughs> so I'd be the first one up, for, and I'd play for three hours at the start, and get the whole crowd crowd vibing, and then a couple of other acts would come on, and then, but I'd be there from the start to when he finished. Wow. And, so as you can imagine, by the time that he finished, I was pretty inebriated and ready to, <laughs> ready carry, to carry on. <laughs> and then we'd I'd go off to another nightclub or something and come home a couple of days later. But uh, <laughs> yeah, it was it was just really good fun. And um, I wish I was doing that again. Oh mate, that's golden. That is golden. That is golden. But I, I do want to know, as a DJ, with some of these sort of nights and people, and I reckon there's a lot of good people you've met. Do you have like a a memorable moment? Like a real sort of like standout one because I know you've got a lot, but is there one that's like pretty just like holy even for you? Yeah, it was um, when Daft Punk to Australia. Um, I was good friends with Busy P, who was their manager, and he had Ed Banger Records, and Busy P actually. I was in his top eight on MySpace. So this is going back a few years <laughs> what ago. What a name, yeah? by the way, Busy yeah, P. Rate I, that already. And I was Busy T on MySpace because <laughs> like, I because I love the guy. And we kind of looked like twins but like 30 years apart type of vibe. Oh. And um, he announced like the Justice first ever tour to Australia on my MySpace wall. Um, so I know you're a bit young to understand what MySpace is. Oh, mate, I had top friends. So oh, there was you a go. negotiation with females. Yep. If you put yourself in line, <laughs> I'll be there. Yeah, so... Um, we we had the official Daft Punk after parties at One Love. Oh, wow. Um, and so it was just Sebastian and Kavinsky were DJing. Daft Punk weren't, weren't even going to come. But the back room we had at Prince, we kept as a green room for um, all the Daft Punk crew and everything like that. And so we had decks in there because that's where I used to play. And I was just basically in charge of DJing the private after party. So there's all the crew from Modular that put on the show, all the Bang Gang DJs and all the other DJs that would the support, Car Copy and Vanshee and all the acts that were on board, um, a few birds and stuff. And it was just like really, really good vibes. And Busy P. Pedro comes over to me. He's like, oh, have you met the Daft Punk guys yet? I go, nah. He's like, all right, I'll, I'll, introduce, I'll bring them over. And, oh, I, goodness and I, was playing like this, I was playing this Nile Rogers record, like some chic record. I can't remember which one it was. <laughs> and he's like, oh, uh, Tyson, uh, this is Thomas Ben Gutter and uh, Guy Manuel. Uh, this is Daft Punk. This is Tyson, DJ Generic, best DJ in Australia. And I'm like, what an intro. Wow, well, like, thank you. <laughs> clearly lying, but yeah, thank you. And then Thomas is like, oh man, the music's been great tonight. I love this record. It's my favorite chic record. And I'm like, you're welcome. And um, <laughs> yeah, that, that for me was like That's an incredible like- moment, right? Because it's probably the only time I've been starstruck. Uh, 
Is that like me meeting Michael Jordan or something? Yeah. Like in your field? Like yeah, kind of... has to be. Yeah. Yeah. It'd be like if Steph Curry said, I really like your like release angle or something. Oh, wow. Like you'd... Yeah, like your pull up from the three yeah. point line. That's... Yeah, that, that's, there's no bigger compliment, basically. Wow. So, um, yeah, like, or Jordan saying, yeah, you've got a great leap on you, Jakey. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Thank you, <laughs> you got some. You've got some hops. hops. That's what I'm talking yeah. about. Uh, yeah, so that, that was incredible. But um, there's been a few few funny stories. Do you do like the kick-ons happen in the DJ industry like and is it like a celebrity <laughs> executive suite without incriminating anyone like is, um, it, is it does that happen because we know it happens in Melbourne. <laughs> <laughs> Never been to one in my life. Uh, yeah, I bet you uh, have it. No, yeah, it does in in different industry uh, in different areas um but a lot of the time it's very hard especially mm. with touring DJs because they're bouncing from Yeah, they they're going to another place. Um when you're in the same spot for a while, that's when usually the fun happens. Mm. Um, but yeah, if you if it's like the peak of summer and there's tours happening, it's very rare. Although a beef is a different like zone where there is just parties for days. It doesn't stop. Yeah. But it's all it's almost scheduled in. So like a guy like Solomon will play a show and then he'll have four days off so he can DJ for four hours in this place called the cave. That's... Which is like a cave built into the side of a mountain <laughs> at a house. <laughs> and which, he's renowned for that. Which I ended up at the first time I ever went to Ibiza. Oh, great. you're joking. Yeah. That is unbelievable. Because he famous Solomon's famous in Melbourne for the Melbourne after party. Yeah. And the, went on and ran yeah, the show. The decks on the ironing yeah, board. Yeah, the ironing board, yeah. which is one of the Dylan Friends podcasts, the guys who've you know, orchestrated that. They talk about it, and I felt like I was there. I was just like, it was so amazing. And I saw him in Mykonos. I had no idea <laughs> he had that side to him. But yeah. you're telling me you've been to one in a cave somewhere off the, off yeah, the shore of Yeah, there's, the, there's this house, and it's like a massive house, got a pool, guest house, all that stuff. There's like a a car park for like 20 cars. There's a soccer pitch. And as you're walking down to like the soccer pitch, there's just like this landing area and there's a round wooden door and it says the cave, K-A-V-E. And you roll the wooden door across as a nightclub built into the house, uh, into the cave, like into the mountain. Oh my God. And so the first time I ever went to Ibiza, I ended up, <laughs> actually, this is a really good, I'll tell this story properly. Please, give me it all. Yeah, this is a good one. So, we're going to clip this. I can already tell. Yeah, I think you'll probably clip this one. This is good. So I was going over for my mate Kaz James's 30th birthday. And I'd never been to a beta. And I was there for two weeks. And I was pretty pumped. <laughs> and um, I was I was staying with, with my mate Raf. Um, he's like a 50-year-old bloke, was one of the partners in One Love and Stereosonic. And then another guy, Sammy, who was from uh, Byron. So Sammy had come from Vegas where he was hanging with the Stafford brothers. So he was feeling a bit average and I'd flown for 40 hours. And Sammy was only coming to Ibiza for a couple of days, but mm -hmm. I was there for the two weeks. And so we landed and he, and he goes, oh, Tice, I know you don't feel like it, but I really want to go to DC 10 tonight. It's the only night I can go to DC 10 because DC 10, famous club, it's only open two nights of the week. Oh, or it, wow. was, it was then. Okay. So, and it's really where all the underground DJs – it, it, it pops. Yeah, it, it, that's the spot. Oh, that's, that's it the just spot. sounds cool. Yeah. It's like one massive room, red, and the sun comes through the windows and stuff. It's, oh, it's a vibe. There's a bit of you about that. Yeah, it's a, it's a good vibe. And so Sammy's like, come on, let's go. I go, okay, we'll go, but only for an hour. And, <laughs> oh, and Raf goes, Raf goes, all right, I'll drive you guys, but take your sunglasses. And we go, no, nah, mate, we're wrecked. Like, I've flown for 40 hours. There's no chance. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I should have taken my sunglasses. Because after we went there, oh, <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll leave out a few details. Yeah, just we don't yeah. want anyone to go to jail. Nah, but got to meet Jamiroquai. Oh, my God. At, at DC10. He was having a great time. <laughs> and then from there we went to uh, Amnesia. Oh, it's a famous club. Yeah, yeah. and then from Amnesia we went back to uh, the cave house. And, yeah, I... I I came home with no shirt, my black jeans, and sunglasses. And Raf goes, oh, you, you got some sunglasses? I'm like, yeah, I traded my T-shirt for it. <laughs> um, and, yeah, we came home two days after we left. So it was a really good party. And having said that, like, Sammy was only staying for two days. He extended his trip while at this kick on. Oh. And, like, during the day, he was on the phone to a travel agent, changed his trip, and ended up staying, like, a week. And we went back to DC 10 the next week. So we could have actually missed that whole thing. And just gone. And just, yeah. Like normal people. It was a wild time. Dude, he was having so much fun. He thought, F 
fuck leaving this place. I need to stay here. Yeah, and that's the that's the type of energy and vibe of Peter is. You don't want to leave. Yeah, you don't want to leave. Yeah. I can I can second it, that. It it's is kind of like Never Never Land. You just don't want to grow up. You don't want to admit <laughs> that there's other things going on in the world. Like yeah. it's like its own little own world inside a world. Mate, what a beautiful story. What a beautiful story. Is is it competitive? Like DJing, like if if you're hearing other tracks that are coming out and you're like, geez, that's good, but you, do you, is there an element of you want to better that or is it very kind of, you know, supportive and um, it's not really as competitive as, as as maybe sport, for example? I think the managers are competitive. Wow, really? Um, but the artists aren't too competitive. Uh, that's from my my sort of side of the fence i can see like some artists go i can't believe that record got on radio this one should get on radio but i think that's kind of like a natural thing but the managers are quite competitive because i know from working with stereo sonic when it comes to billing on a festival Mm. there is so many arguments that go on um with managers and festival owners about who's billed where and i should be billed higher than this person and bar 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 that acts get pulled off festivals because their managers say they're not playing the festival unless they're above this guy. Right. So right. Okay. in that aspect, extremely competitive because the managers just want to make their act the biggest act possible and to make their 20% more. Wow. But um, in terms of DJing, everyone's pretty friendly. There yeah. might be the one or two rivalries like between genres okay. um, where someone slags someone off on Twitter or something like that. Um, like Seth Troxler slagged off camel fat, but then they all made up for it. So I was like, it's just not natural. Nah, (laughs) it's just, it's just strange. But usually the vibes are pretty high. Music's one of those industries where everyone just wants to do what they do and enjoy Enjoy it. it. That's beautiful. And and that's the thing is like, you're not really competing against anyone. You're just doing something that you love. That's awesome. Um, Yeah. Mate, feel the love, one love. You're going to link up with Calvin? After COVID, maybe when it's a normal world and everyone's vaxxed or whatever we've got to do. Yeah, I hope so because we had a bit of a, a soccer, a foot, a five-a-side like teams going. So Jesus, give me the call up. Uh, yeah, well, th- there's been some amazing games. Like <laughs> in, in Ibiza a couple of years ago, we had – it was Tinny Temper, Steve Aoki. Uh, oh, that is unbelievable already. Martin Solveig, Tiga. Um, yeah, uh, that's – who – Ronaldo's played – like the real Ronaldo. As in the Brazilian Ronaldo. Yeah, the Brazilian Ronaldo. That is unbelievable. Del Piero's been in a few games. That's unbelievable. So, the, the, yeah, there's been some vibes. So you've played better soccer players than I have, and I've been a professional. Well, I missed out on both of those I gonna, games. I was going to say. Yeah, the boys got to play with <laughs> Del Piero and Ronaldo. I missed those games. Oh, that's unbelievable. He's so good. I was off doing something else. Um, <laughs> in dancing. the cave, the yeah, cave in the corner of a beach. Yeah, I was dancing in a cave somewhere. <laughs> um, so I missed those games. But, um, yeah, there's been some terrific, terrific football. Oh, mate. Yeah. DJ Generic, Tyson O'Brien, mate. This has been an absolute electrifying podcast, as I expected, mate. So many... Um, so many gems in Wait, here. Am I getting the wind up? I thought no, we you keep, keep going here. Yeah, keep going. Don't <laughs> wind me up. I'm only just starting. Oh, I love this. I love this. <laughs> what are you, are you, you ask me, mate. You're the interviewer. Um, so, quick question, mate. How'd you hurt your foot? Uh, look, that's a long story, Tyson. We don't want to incriminate anyone, as we've mentioned. We don't want anyone to go to jail. But, no, uh, mate, honestly, it's been an absolute joy. And as I said, we, we've broken the mould here. Now I have to feel like we've got to get more DJs, more musicians. Everyone loves sport. Everyone's an athlete. That's that's the common thing is we've all got things in common together. We're, we're DJs and musicians love sports and sports people love music because <laughs> yeah. it's the exact opposite it's of true. what they do. It's true. And it's that's the thing is like, I would love to be able to chase a pigskin around for for a job, yeah. but I can't. So I'm going to just chase yeah. drinks around a nightclub. And, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the athletes want to do that. Exactly. <laughs> Instead, so, yeah. Well, they all end up there anyway. So, <laughs> yeah. And I'll send them all home by 2 a.m. That's it. Nick yeah. Dacos, you are not seeing a nightclub next year. That's I, for sure, He's mate. banned from electric. Yeah, kid. good. Yeah. Well, you're probably going to be heading back to electric in the next five minutes. So Yeah. As long as we can get 12 people on a dance floor, that'd be nice at yeah. some point well, this I'm, year. I'm sure we will. Uh, people in Melbourne, get around to the clubs. Get checking out DJ Generic. He's one of the best blokes in town and one of the best musos going around once we can get back into normality. So... Pleasure having you on, brother. Those words were way too kind, but thank you very much. It was an absolute (laughs) pleasure to be here.